you so much, Secretary You're Mayorkas. <laughs> You're always invited. Open invitation. Okay. Um, one, two items for all of you at the top. In addition, today the Treasury Department released data on the Emergency Rental Assistance Program, which shows that through the month of August, state and local ERA programs, emergency rental assistance programs, have distributed more than 1.4 million payments to households, totaling more than $7.7 billion to support the housing stability of vulnerable renters and landlords. So 420,000 households were served in August, an increase of about 24 percent since since July. Over $2.3 billion in rental assistance was distributed in August, which represents roughly three times the amount spent in May. Uh, we, distrib we expect distribution progress to continue, but even if this pace simply maintains, it would mean 3 million payments to renters in need and $16.7 billion in emergency rental assistance spending, which would have a very meaningful positive impact on 2021. And just quickly on the week ahead. Uh, throughout, we'll obviously have more more to convey to all of you over the weekend, uh, just to set expectations. But throughout next week, the President will continue to engage with members of Congress and congressional leadership on his Build Back Better agenda and the bipartisan infrastructure deal. They will also discuss passing the continuing resolution, providing disaster relief, and avoiding default. And on Wednesday, and we're obviously leaving some space to do exactly that. And on Wednesday, the President will travel to Chicago, Illinois, to highlight the importance of COVID-19 vaccine requirements for businesses. And Again, we'll have more as the week and proceeds. Josh, why don't you go ahead? Thanks, Jen. Two questions. First, the quads meeting mm -hmm. here at the White House. Uh, the president said he doesn't want a new Cold War with China. And yet we've also seen cyber attacks. Businesses are reporting supply chain issues with their suppliers in China. What confidence does the administration and its allies have that China also does not want a new Cold War? Well, what we can speak to is what our intention is. And you heard the President convey clearly in his speech at the UN General Assembly earlier this week that our relationships with China, our approach to China is one of competition and not one of conflict. I will say as it relates to the Quad, which is I think ongoing unless it unless it wrapped and we'll have a robust readout uh, for you with all the deliverables. But the focus of that is not, it's not a security uh, meeting or security uh, apparatus. Um, this is uh, that the, the focus of this um, group is on COVID, climate, emerging, te emerging technology, and infrastructure, all areas where it's incredibly important to coordinate with key partners uh, who are in the global community, including uh, in that region. Understood. Um, I, I guess I, I asked because the Australian PM said free democracy without saying China. Um, but I guess the separate second area is Afghanistan where we had this uh, drone strike, and we now know that this was an aid worker. How did this happen? What does this tell us about our intelligence in Afghanistan? And what are the procedures for accountability going forward? Well, I know last Friday um, the, de the Defense Department uh, did an extensive briefing on this and put out an extensive uh, statement where they conveyed clearly uh, that this was a horrible mistake. Uh, that this was a tragedy, as is the loss of civilian life in any occasion, and certainly in this case. Uh, there's also been, uh, they've also, they also announced that they would look back at the CENTCOM review that they announced last week. So that is a process that would be ongoing uh, and undergone at the Department of Defense. I would note, and I'm not sure if this was exactly your question, but uh, some have asked about what it means for our over the horizon capabilities and capacities. And I don't know if that's what you were getting at. As we look to Afghanistan, as we look to preventing terrorists from, uh, you know, threatening our partners or even threatening our homeland. One, of course, we watch that closely from our intelligence community. They do regular briefings, as you've seen on the Hill. But also, over-the-horizon capacity is not the same as uh, steps that were taken, as is the, it was in the case of this drone strike or the strike before it, uh, where our th troops are uh, threatened on the ground and where immediate action needs to be taken in order to prevent or attempt to prevent their lives from being threatened. Obviously, this was a horrific mistake. Over the horizon capacity, you have more time to consider, to look at targets, to consider intelligence, and that's the difference in how we would approach it moving forward. But there would be a look at the CENTCOM review, and that's something that would come out of the Department of Defense. I just want to jump around because I promised I would. Okay, let's go to Al Jazeera first. Yes, thank you. Hey, 
Um, I've been trying to ask this question for months. I appreciate you taking it. It's a freedom of the press question. Members of the administration, you recently this week have talked about the importance of journalism to democracy. The president also made a point of saying his presidency was different from his predecessor. So why is President Biden keeping the Trump era charges against Julian Assange? Why is he allowing the prosecution for publishing the truth about human rights abuses in Iraq, Afghanistan, Guantanamo? And does the president believe the ongoing detention of Assange is reasonable, even moral, given the transparency delivered and the greater good served? Well, I don't have anything new to say on the uh, on uh, Julian Assange, and I would point you to the Department of Justice on that. I would say, though, that we do think of ourselves, and we are approaching this from an entirely different approach of the last few years as it relates to freedom of the press. And I think the Department of Justice's actions as it relates to uh, the prosecution of journalists or how we're going to look at or go after records, something that the uh, Attorney General made an announcement about, the President has spoken to, is very clear evidence of exactly that. And see this as a freedom of press issue with respect to Assange? Again, I have nothing I have nothing new to speak to on Julian Assange. This is something that I emailed you about months ago, so there's been time to I understand. discuss this. I understand. I understand. I still don't something? I don't have a new comment from here. Go you ahead. don't want to touch this. I have one more. Yeah. Sure, go ahead. Months. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, you know, we've talked about the images that these that the Al Jazeera footage exposed with respect to the horses yeah. along the border. The pain that that conjures up for African Americans in this country. The president has condemned this, but uh, you know, the president has also promised African Americans in this country that he had their back. Al Sharpton has said this week, we're being stabbed in the back, Mr. President, we need you to stop the stabbing from Haiti to Harlem. He's talking about the failure of the police reform bill. What does the president need to do to address this? What does he need to do more for the community? You said this week, there's been the engagement with leaders, but does the president need to do more than that? And what should he be doing? Well, first I would say, since you referenced police reform, the president is absolutely frustrated that we haven't been able to move forward with police reform. Uh, he supported uh, the efforts by negotiators uh, on the Democratic side, on the Republican side, to fr try to find common ground. He also was frustrated that they couldn't, f move, they weren't able to move forward despite the fact that there was agreement from even police organizations and others about what, about what the path forward looked like. Uh, so he's incredibly frustrated. It requires Congress moving forward in order to have that kind of lasting impact, but the president has also been clear he's going to engage with advocates, engage with members, and also uh, consider options like executive actions, which is something that we did not act on because we wanted to leave space for these negotiations to continue. African American voters feel recognized that they are being seen, that they're being heard. I mean, bring it down. To the, to the layman level. You asked me specifically about police reform, so that's why I addressed that specific question. I would say that the president has been an advocate for civil rights changes, for reforms that are needed, for equity across our system from for many, many decades, and that is a central tenet of his presidency. And that is evidence in the, a range of executive orders that he signed early on in his presidency, his advocacy for voting rights, for police reform, uh, and certainly the comments and remarks you heard him give this morning. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, the uh, former president last night, in response to the subpoenas that were announced by the January 6th committee, said that he was going to assert executive privilege. Um, he's not in the branch anymore, so I don't think he can do that. Has he reached out, or has his people reached out to the Biden administration to say, hey, we don't want communications between uh, uh, former President Trump and Mark Meadows, for example, to be released? And how would uh, this White House deal with that kind of request? Well, I'm not aware of any outreach. Uh, we don't get regular outreach from the former president or his team. I think it's safe to assume. Um, I would say that uh, we take this matter incredibly seriously. The president has already concluded that um, uh, it would not be appropriate to assert executive privilege. Uh, and so we will respond promptly to these questions as they arise, uh, and certainly as they come up from Congress. Uh, and certainly we, are, we have been working closely with, uh, with congressional committees and others as they work to get to the bottom of what happened on January 6th, an incredibly dark day in our democracy. Okay, let's go uh, to Yahoo. Uh, Jen, throughout much of the spring and early summer, our vaccination goal was 70% for uh, adults. What is it now? 
Uh, it's uh, much higher than that. I'm happy to get the, the up-to-date to today data from uh, the COVID team. I know it's over 75%. Uh, it's something that we see continue to climb. It's something that we've seen climb uh, over the past several weeks as mandates have put, put, put in place by companies, uh, as there has been, unfortunately, a rising fear of Delta, as people have seen horrific images on television. Uh, so we have seen uh, encouraging climbs in vaccinations and vaccination rates in communities across the country. What are we trying to hit? When, when will we know that we've succeeded in our vaccination? We're going effort? to try to get as many people in the country vaccinated as humanly possible. We're not going to put an end limit on that. It's a it's a continuing work, a continuing top priority of this administration. Shelby, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, so we know that the vice president has been tasked with addressing the root causes of migration. A Democratic congressman from Texas told CNN yesterday that the vice president's trip to Mexico and Central America had no impact. So first, I'm wondering if the administration can just detail some tangible examples of the actions in addressing the root causes of migration that have had a tangible, you know, this, uh, an actual impact. And then secondly, what specific causes, root causes, is the vice president currently addressing to help curb Haitian migration from places like Chile and Brazil? Well, uh, I think as the Vice President and the President have both conveyed, this is going to be a long-term effort. And what the focus is on is addressing root causes like corruption, like economic circumstances that are impacting people and prompting them to want to come to the United States. So that requires working with governments, both to put in place new migration proceedings and, and processes or limitations sometimes at borders. We've seen some impacts of those over the course of the last several months. It also includes providing assistance and engaging closely with these leaders on what steps can be taken. And the Vice President has been deeply engaged in this. But again, as it relates to Haiti, uh, as it relates to our broken immigration system, uh, the clear step that needs to be taken is an immigration bill needs to pass Congress. It's a broken system, one that is ineffective, one that is not moral in many cases at this point in time. It's long overdue. There are a lot of Republicans out there giving speeches about how outraged they are about the situation at the border, not many who are putting forward uh, solutions or steps that we could take. So we're a little tired of the speeches. We'd like to partner on solutions and working together to address this problem that has not been partisan in the past. Go ahead. Thank you, Jen. Uh, two quick questions. Uh, the president met just two days ago with a group of lawmakers, uh, five hours of meetings. Does he have a better sense after all of those meetings, five hours of meetings, as to whether or not the vote will take place? this Monday on the bipartisan Senate bill in the House of Representatives. Well, our work did not stop after those five hours of meetings, um, and the president has always known that this would be a key inflection point, and we are certainly at one right at this moment, because while there is broad agreement on the need to lower costs for child care, for elder care, for college, for uh, preschool, uh, the need to rebuild bridges and roads, the need to address the climate crisis, the need to uh, re have a more fair tax system, there are discussions about the size. Now, as the president said multiple times this morning, uh, the package will cost zero dollars. There are a range of revenue options that can cover whatever the cost of the package looks like. But these are important discussions that need to be had. We know that there are differences of opinion among members of our own party, and we're still at work at it. And our team was still at work yesterday. I will say as it relates uh, to the next steps here, we want to win the vote when it happens. That's our objective. The second question has to do with COVID protocols that exist uh, in the West Wing in particular. Sure. Uh, the president meets regularly with his counterparts, like today, yep. from around the world. He meets with lawmakers. He meets with activists, with private citizens from time to time. When new ambassadors present their credentials, they do so right now by Zoom. Is there a particular reason why the president doesn't meet with those new ambassadors face-to-face, -face, like uh, has been done in the past by other presidents? I know he's eager to do that in the future. Uh, I don't have any more information or prediction of when that may happen, but certainly something he looks forward to doing, and he respects and values the role of ambassadors who are serving around the world. But is there a particular reason why he's not doing that right now, why he's doing it by Zoom? Uh, it's not a COVID reason, but uh, I'm happy to check if there's a plan for welcoming ambassadors in person anytime soon. Chris, do you have a question? I don't want to, I don't want to put you on the spot. 
or Chris may not. And go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Um, it's a Friday. So I want to clarify something sure. um, you said a moment ago, and then I have another question. When you say that the president has determined that it's not appropriate to assert executive privilege in the January 6th documents matter, is that a blanket statement, or would you, are you going to evaluate the requests from the uh, investigating group as they come in one by one with an eye to not asserting executive privilege? And it's an eye to not asserting executive privilege, Anne, and obviously, some of this is is predicting what we don't know yet, uh, but that is certainly his overarching view. Is there something that you wouldn't turn over that you can think of? I don't think I'm going to get ahead of a hypothetical, but that is what's important for people to know and understand is that's the principle through which we're approaching this. Okay. And then separately on the potential government shutdown, has there been any determination or thought put yet to what happens to ongoing COVID? related work during a potential shutdown? I'm thinking of potentially like the Department of Labor working on their mandate ideas. So um, we obviously want to do everything we can to avoid a government shutdown. I can tell you that as it relates to exemptions, our expectation is because it's public health work, is that uh, the vast majority of work on COVID would be exempted. Uh, but I think it's safe to say that even if that, even with that being the case, that having the government shut down and having the impact on systems, on processes, on personnel is not ideal and uh, more than not ideal is uh, would be would be challenging as we're fight facing a pandemic as we're working uh, to get a lot of programs funding out to people across the country which is why we're we're focused on avoiding it go ahead patsy thank you jen uh, i have two questions on the quad summit and an apology to Anne for cutting in line so on um, oh it's okay we we tried to call in chris but <laughs> So it's okay. Quad, Go ahead. Uh, uh, President Biden said that the quad, uh, so, uh, the quad is on track to produce 1 billion doses of vaccine by the end of 2022. I believe it's produced and not delivered. And then also on the doses already pledged, the initial 500 million doses announced in June, that's 200 million delivered by end of 2021, the rest by mid-2022. And then the latest 500 million announced delivered by the end of the next year. So first, can you confirm if I have that timeline right? Second. Can the world wait that long, especially if the goal to end the pandemic is by end of 2022? That delivery timeline does not seem to support that. Well, let me confirm the specifics here. So uh, the timeline for delivery of the of these 500 million doses, first 200 million doses will be delivered by June of 2022, I think, as you said, second 300 million doses will be delivered by uh, quarter three of 2022, and total will donate 1 billion doses of Pfizer uh, that's part of that total. Obviously, we've already donated 160 million doses already to date. Uh, what I will say, Patsy, is that uh, right now uh, we are still the world's largest contributor of vaccine doses by more than every other country in the world combined. We have committed to give more th for every one dose here we've committed to give three doses uh, overseas that is it that is more than anyone else no one else in the world can say that so and we're also helping produce uh, uh, add to manufacturing capacity uh, the quad partnership uh, who was here of course meeting as we speak is on track to produce at least 1 billion uh, vaccine doses by the end of 2022 we're also working to boost vaccine manufacturing in south africa but we need help from the rest of the developed world and the rest of the developed world needs to also step up we're going to continue to increase our our role uh, in contributing vaccines contributing know-how uh, making sure uh, that we are uh, playing a constructive role in bringing an end to the pandemic but we need the rest of the world to step up uh, and that's what our focus is on. Karen, go ahead. Question on Quad. Uh, did the president discuss over the horizon capacity with Prime Minister Modi in particular, whether it involves Pakistan or India? It's. Um, I know we were going to give a put out a joint statement. I'm not sure if it's out at this point in time. The Quad meeting was also ongoing when I came out here, but we'll have a lot that we will put out to all of you. Go ahead, Karen. Thanks, Jen. Two questions. Um, the DHS secretary several times said he didn't want to impair the integrity of the investigation to the Border Patrol agents. He said, I will not prejudge the facts. Did the president prejudge the facts when he said, I promise you those people will pay? I think what you heard from the president is a very uh, human and visceral response to those images, which I think reflects how a lot of people in the country felt when they saw them. There is an investigation the Department of Homeland Security is overseeing. That will determine what the personnel decisions may be, any other policy decisions, 
and that needs to see itself through. But I think the president wanted to make clear to people who watched those photos, who uh, had understandably emotional responses, uh, that that's not acceptable to him. Uh, even while the investigation is being uh, is being is happening and moving forward, that will determine what the consequences will look like. On the reconciliation package, uh, Senator Manchin told reporters on Wednesday night that the president, quote, basically just said, find a number you're comfortable with based on the needs you still have and how we deliver it to the American people. The president today said, forget the number and that lawmakers shouldn't be focusing on that top line number. So what changed from Wednesday's meeting when he said, give me a number to today to forget the number. I know this sounds hard to believe, but they're not actually contradictory. Uh, what the president was trying to convey today repeatedly is that there's a lot of focus on the top line number, but ultimately there are a range of proposals on how to pay for it by making the tax system more fair. So actually the cost is zero. That was the point he was making. So, uh, and that's why he's been so focused on telling the story of the substance. And as it relates to Senator Manchin or anyone else uh, who may have different points of view, and we welcome that in the Democratic Party, of course, in democracy, um, yes, part of this is, is a disagreement or discussion, I should say, about what the size of the package, old, what the top line, even though it's going to be paid for and will cost zero, will look like. So both things are true. Go ahead. Good. What's the, I mean, the president, what's his approach at this point in time with his domestic agenda? And the reason I ask that yeah. is because there have been moments, particularly with COVID relief, where he was basically like, I need this and I need this now to mm -hmm. lawmakers. Lawmakers I spoke to and met with them on Wednesday were very clear. He was soliciting information. What are you looking at? What do you need? What's important to you? When does he hit the moment of, all right, I need this now. <laughs> like, we need to get this done. This is by red line. We're moving. Well. I talked to the president about this this morning. Uh, his view is that this is a process, and uh, he understands and has lived through many of these processes in the past. And his approach is you have to listen. You have to hear people out. You have to answer their questions. Uh, and yes, at a certain point, you need to forge a path forward and look to unify a range of viewpoints on wherever there may be some marginal disagreements. We're in the middle of that inflection point now. Uh, and the next several days, weeks are going to be pivotal in that. There's no question about it. But he also understands and has been through enough of these processes before to know that he needs to listen, he needs to be a partner with members, and he's ready to pick up the phone, invite people down, COVID-friendly snacks, as I said the other day, uh, to play a constructive role in that. He also knows that sometimes those conversations need to happen at a staff level, a senior staff level, or uh, me or uh, senior staff to member level or staff to committee level. Uh, he, he knows of, of all people how this process works and he's just evaluating hour by hour how he can be m the most constructive in unifying a, a path forward. Go ahead. Just uh, one other question. Um, what, if any, comment does the White House have on the apparent results of the new GOP back review of ballots in Maricopa County? The draft report appears to show the president earned 99 more votes. The former president, 261 fewer. It confirmed what we have all known for some time uh, and what millions and millions of people in the country know. And with Republicans pushing for similar reviews in Texas, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, is there anything the federal government or the White House can do to address that, given that members of your party are concerned about this ongoing attempt or actual review of ballots? Uh, that's a good question, Ed. I, I'll have to check and see if there's anything substantively, which is, I think, what you're asking me, uh, that we would have the power to do in this case. Go ahead. Thank you, Jen. Two topics really quick. First, the President has said, and you have tweeted, that allegations of wrongdoing based on files pulled from Hunter Biden's laptop are Russian disinformation. There is a new book by a political reporter that finds some of the files on there are genuine. Is the White House still going with Russian disinformation? I think it's broadly known and widely known, Peter, that there was a broad range of Russian disinformation back in 2020. Okay, moving on to the border. Following up on a question from earlier in the week, why hasn't President Biden ever visited the southern border? What would you like him to do at the southern border, and what impact do you think that would have on the policies? Why doesn't he want to go? I don't think it's an issue of wanting to go. I think it's an issue of what's most constructive to address 
what we see is a challenging situation at the border and a broken immigration system. And his view is the most constructive role we can play is by helping to push immigration for, uh, reform forward, helping reform the broken policies of the last several years, uh, and listening to his team of advisors who have been to the border multiple times about what the path forward should look like. So why is this the one crisis then that he thinks he can manage better from here without having seen it than going to the southern border? And I can it? assure you the president is well aware of what the challenges are in our broken immigration system, something he watched closely over the last four years. Okay, go ahead, Steve. Just to put, put a fine point on your answer to Karen's question, sure. I'm sure that the union officials and lawyers who will be representing these agents are yeah. want to know. Uh, is it your view or the White House's position that what the President said this morning is not legally operative with respect to consequences and these people paying? It was simply his personal view and not representative of actions that the government will take? The President was not prejudging the outcome of an investigation either. The President was responding from his heart and responding uh, to uh, seeing uh, horrific photos uh, that we have seen over the last several days. Well, he is the head of the executive branch. The Constitution vests him with the authority in Article 2. You're saying that what he said will not necessarily be the outcome? Again, there's an investigation that's ongoing. I don't know that anyone saw those photos and didn't have a similar reaction to the president's, and that was what it was a reflection of. Uh, go ahead. Thank you, Jim. Uh, as you know, Afghanistan's situation is still bad, and lack of food in Afghanistan. I don't know that the uh, United States has any plan for humanitarian uh, help and assist with Afghan people. We actually uh, do. So I would say the Department of Treasury actually today announced two general licenses to allow humanitarian aid to continue to flow in Afghanistan despite U.S. sanctions. And our priority is, of course, ensuring that 100 percent of humanitarian assistance goes directly to independent organizations like U.N. agencies and NGOs who can provide vulnerable Af Afghans with critically needed food, emergency health needs, including COVID-19, and other urgently needed humanitarian relief. So all funds are directly closely vetted uh, through local and international partners. This is one of the reasons we've been focused on getting the airport up and running. And these NGOs uh, and uh, UN agencies are experienced in working in challenging environments to get the food and assistance to exactly the right people. Um, go ahead. Okay, last one. I'm never, sorry, last two. Go ahead. Quickly, Nancy Pelosi said, as we've noted, that there's going to be a vote. They hope to pass both the bipartisan infrastructure bill and the social safety net multi trillion dollar bill with details still to be ironed out. What is the political risk for Democrats if that does not pass on Monday? We want, uh, when the vote happens, we want to win the vote. Uh, that's what our focus is on. We'll let leadership determine uh, the next steps beyond that. Understanding that, but recognizing, as we've heard from some progressives, that they may have as many as 90 plus votes who would oppose this right now if there isn't passage by the the Senate on the on the social safety net bill. What, what's it? I mean, what's at risk? This is ultimately what the president ran on that he could get these things done. So what what is the risk in terms of the motivating factor for Democrats? Our, our objective is for when the vote is called for us to be able to win the vote. Uh, so I don't think that's a point we're planning for at this point in time. All right. Oh, Rachel, last one. Uh, just one quick question on the January 6th election sure. in Congress. We know he sent out those subpoenas to Trump's inner circle. Congressman Adam Schiff said that he would ask the Justice Department to enforce those subpoenas mm -hmm. if necessary. Does the administration in the White House support that? Well, I know that they've been called to appear in October, I believe, if I saw in reporting. So in our view, it would be premature to discuss uh, either point, uh, discuss this, I should say, or speak to it, uh, because the subpoenas have just been issued, and we haven't seen their response quite yet. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great weekend.